This video was made possible by Brilliant. Learn with Brilliant for 20% off by being one of the first 200 to sign up at brilliant.org slash Wendover. Modern medicine requires blood. It is a crucial element to the successful treatment of countless conditions. Blood transfusions are by far the most common procedure performed in most hospitals. In fact, they are so routine that even ambulance EMTs are now performing them in the field for traumatic injuries. The only problem is that, at least right now, the blood we use for human transfusions has to come from humans. Synthetic blood substitutes are under development, but for now, real, donated human blood is all we can use. This blood, though, has a shelf life. Red blood cells, the most commonly transfused blood product, have a government-mandated shelf life of 42 days in the US, 35 days in Europe, and similar numbers in the rest of the world. There's even some research suggesting that red blood cells deteriorate in quality after as little as 21 days, so there's a big focus on getting them from donor to recipient as quickly as possible. Even 21 days probably seems like plenty of time, but huge quantities of blood are taken from huge numbers of individuals and there are plenty of steps in between donation and transfusion. In developed countries like the UK, this supply chain works quite similarly to any other. The NHS Blood and Transplant Division manages the process for England and Wales. About 90% of their blood comes from donations given in their mobile blood banks that visit schools, community centers, sports clubs, and other locations. Donors are first screened verbally and through a hemoglobin test, then a single unit of blood, 470 milliliters, is taken. After a day of collection, product is taken back to the nearest of 13 processing centers. Over the following days, the blood is placed on a centrifuge where it separates into red blood cells and plasma. There are then additional tests to determine blood type and to assure it's safe to transfuse, and then it's packaged up and sent to hospitals via truck. As a whole, NHS Blood and Transplant aims to have between 40,000 and 50,000 units of blood in their system at any given time to deal with surges in demand. While red blood cells will last for about a month, platelets and some other blood products will last for less than a week, so this whole process has to be sped up. Of course, there are other products that require fast transportation, like fresh fish and flowers, but the difference between these two is that if fish and flowers run out, people complain. If blood products run out, people die. Stock out just is not possible in the blood supply chain, which means countries have to have enough blood in their system to deal with surges in demand associated with situations like natural disasters and other mass casualty events. Because of this, there is always a decent amount of waste. Blood will quite often expire before it's used, but that's just a luxury rich countries like the UK have. Collecting and certifying blood isn't cheap, but still, they're able to spend their way into creating enough blood products so that there are almost never stockouts. Less developed countries, though, don't have that luxury. Like the UK, the sub-Saharan African country of Rwanda operates a system of universal healthcare, but, like the population, the government is not rich, so it can't afford for much waste in its blood distribution system. The average resident of the UK makes about 40,000 US dollars per year. The average resident of Rwanda, on the other hand, makes just $720. Despite being a country of 12 million, Rwanda's economy is about the same size as the small British city of Plymouth. There's an anomaly in the country's indicators, though. It sits as the 17th poorest country in sub-Saharan Africa, well in the bottom half, although, in terms of life expectancy, it's tied for fourth best. Rwanda has been identified as having one of the best healthcare systems in Africa. In fact, its 67-year life expectancy is higher than that of some far richer African countries like Namibia and South Africa. The reason behind this no doubt has a lot to do with the fact that Rwanda, uncharacteristically for a poor African country, has a universal healthcare system where everyone has access to hospitals at an affordable or no cost, but, in addition, some have attributed Rwanda's healthcare success to its willingness to embrace innovation. One of the most visible of these innovations has to do with how the country's hospitals get their blood. They've outsourced much of the country's blood delivery to a company called Zipline, and Zipline delivers blood to hospitals across Rwanda by drone. This is one of the world's first commercial applications of drone delivery. While companies like Google and Amazon are testing drone delivery in developed countries, Rwanda, a developing country, already has a full-scale, nearly countrywide drone delivery system in service right now. How it works is this. The drones currently service 21 hospitals in the western half of the country. The closest is just 2.5 miles or 4 kilometers from Zipline's facility in Muhanga, with the furthest being about 50 miles or 80 kilometers away. Any of these hospitals can place an order with Zipline pretty much in any way they can. Email, text, phone, WhatsApp, anything. 
Within this building, the individual sitting on the left takes orders, passes information onto the next person in the process, and stays in contact with the hospital throughout the process to let them know when their delivery will arrive. The individual on the right is then in charge of packaging up the delivery. Zipline's blood products are delivered to them by road from the Rwandan health system, so they have a supply on hand. The product is packaged into one of these boxes. The whole process is designed to be as simple as possible, so these boxes are single use. They're assembled on site from cardboard, bubble wrap, and tape, with a parachute being made from paper. That way, nobody has to drive out to hospitals to pick parachutes and boxes up. From there, the box is passed through the window and a bell is rung to let the next person know the delivery is ready. The delivery is brought over to a ready drone, an app is used to scan QR codes to verify the delivery and drone, then the delivery is placed in the body of the drone. The drone is then picked up and brought over to the catapult. Meanwhile, another operator comes over and fixes the wings on the drone while another places the battery pack in. The drone is now almost ready for flight, but first the operators perform a visual inspection for damage and use an app to check to be sure that all moving components are working. During this whole process, someone else is sitting in what's known as the crow's nest, performing another crucial step. This individual is essentially air traffic control for Zipline. They're in charge of the drones while they're flying, so the first step is to coordinate with Rwandan air traffic control to make sure that they have clearance to fly. Now, Rwandan airspace is not busy. In fact, Zipline has about as many daily flights as Kigali Airport, the main airport in the country, so it's rare not to gain clearance immediately, but still, this individual calls into Kigali to be sure. From there, they give clearance to the catapult operator to launch, and the catapult operator makes sure nobody is standing in front of the launch site. There are quite often children on the other side of the fence watching the goings on. From there, they press the green button, an electric motor spins, pulls the catapult, and the drone reaches takeoff speed in a fraction of a second. Once in flight, the drone follows a preset flight path. Now, the drone is autonomous, it flies itself, but it has no decision-making authority. It flies high enough where it doesn't require any obstacle avoidance ability, and if it needs to hold for a minute to wait for air traffic to clear, it's told by the controller to enter a preset holding pattern. There are few weather conditions that these drones can't fly through. They can handle severe wind, rain, and lightning, but if they can't make it to their destination, they can also use one of these preset holding patterns to turn around. While the drones have improved greatly since a few years ago, a critical fault does happen every few hundred or so flights. In this case, the drone has a built-in parachute that it triggers itself to safely fall back to the ground. Crucially, no one has ever been injured by a zipline drone. If for any reason a drone needs to stop flying immediately, such as if Zipline were to receive an order by air traffic control to immediately get out of certain airspace, the controller back at base could also manually trigger the parachute to deploy. From there, operators would go out and recover the drones by road. The drones fly at 60 miles or 100 kilometers per hour, so they reach the nearest hospitals in mere minutes, while the furthest hospitals, about 50 miles or 80 kilometers away, require about a 50 minute flight to reach. As a drone reaches its delivery point, the individual in charge of communication will text the hospital to let them know. The drone will approach the delivery point, circle around to lose altitude, then fly a few hundred feet over a predetermined landing spot, open its belly doors, and drop the package. The parachute will slow its fall, but impact is also softened by the bubble wrap inside. From there, the blood product has arrived, and hospital staff just walk outside to collect it. For the nearest sites, these blood deliveries arrive in about 15 minutes, ready to be transfused into patients critically in need. But the process isn't over yet. The drone gains altitude, flies back towards the zipline site, then circles again to lose altitude. Now, you'll notice these drones have no wheels. That would add unnecessary weight and complexity. Once they've reached a precise altitude, the drone will come in against the wind, about 15 feet or 5 meters above the ground, then bam. As quickly as the drone launched, it's landed. A tiny hook on the back of the drone catches a wire mid-air, then the drone swings to a stop. The level of precision needed to make this landing process work is remarkable and is a testament to how far drone technology has come. The operators take the wings and batteries off, put the drone back on its stand, and it's ready to go again, just like that. Now, Rwanda is not a large country physically. It's far smaller than the UK, so you might wonder why they can't just rely on blood delivery by road like the UK. For one, Rwanda's road infrastructure is lacking. While the major roads are paved and in good quality, the majority of the country's roads are dirt. When it's dry, these roads work alright, but Rwanda sees two significant rainy seasons from February to June and September to December when there are heavy rains almost every day. With this, these dirt roads can become impassable for days due to floods and mud. One solution could be to stock rural hospitals with plenty of blood products to last through periods when trucks can't get to them, but that would lead to heavy wastage, and safe processed blood isn't cheap. It would also prevent the usage of platelets and plasma, which only have shelf lives of under a week. 
Therefore, the drones make it so that, no matter the conditions, any hospital in the network can receive red blood products in under an hour. While most deliveries just serve to restock these sites, about a third are for emergency situations where a hospital is out of stock of a particular blood product that a patient needs. Now, the potential applications of this type of technology stretch far beyond its current application. While the drones currently deliver just blood, Zipline is testing delivery of about 500 other medical products including bandages, medicines, almost anything a hospital could need, so that if a hospital is missing something, they can get it in at most an hour. They're also preparing to put a drone base online in the eastern half of the country to have nearly nationwide coverage. One potential application of having two bases within range of each other is that if one base runs out of a product that is needed on its side of the country, a drone can be loaded from the other base, fly over, land, have its battery replaced, and launched again to fly to its final delivery point. Rwanda is quite a well-suited test case for this drone technology since it is fairly small and densely populated, but this feasibility of transferring drones between bases could also help create a network structure that works for less dense countries. The Ghanaian parliament recently approved an agreement with Zipline to expand into their country. Ghana is rather tall and narrow, with density, as a rule, more or less decreasing as one goes north. While the exact service areas and details have yet to be announced, what could work on a conceptual level would be to have a number of bases within range of each other. The rarest, most expensive, or lowest demand products such as platelets and plasma could be stored at the southernmost base and, if needed, could be sent north to the less busy bases serving less dense and less busy areas by a drone stopping at each base and having their batteries swapped. Lastly, one other potential application for these drones is for disaster relief. The bare basics needed to start operations can be packed into a single shipping container and assembled in just a few days. The system is designed for places like Rwanda where road infrastructure is lacking, and after major natural disasters, road infrastructure often is lacking. It could be quite impactful to be able to deploy a relatively low-cost, high-frequency delivery system over a disaster area using drones like these. While the zipline system is not currently set up for fast deployment in disaster relief situations, the company has considered working on this for the future so they could set up a base, plan flight paths, and begin operations quickly. So far, Zipline's drones have, in their initial deployment in Rwanda, served their mission effectively of reliably linking rural hospitals to modern medical product. Having proved themselves with this first deployment, the company is now entering a phase of rather fast expansion both in the scope of their service in Rwanda and the number of countries served overall. Of course, the drone solution is just a bandage on a wider problem of poor transportation infrastructure in Rwanda and other developing countries, but at least in the long period of time a developing country waits to be developed, drone technology might be an effective solution for improving medical logistics fast. There are loads of interesting physics that go into how drones like those flying in Rwanda work. For example, with a quadcopter, there is a theoretical limit to how large a battery a drone can have since eventually, the extra power needed to carry the extra weight of the battery is greater than the extra power the extra battery provides. Brilliant's classical mechanics course teaches you how to calculate what the maximum theoretical flying time, using this principle, would be for a DJI Mavic Pro, of course in addition to plenty of other useful physics concepts. Like all Brilliant courses, this one teaches you the small intuitive concepts behind the big subjects and then links them all together so that you can truly understand what you're learning. You don't just memorize procedures and facts. If you're at all interested in logic, computer memory, number theory, quantum computing, or any of their dozens of other courses, you can try a few of them for free by signing up at brilliance.org slash Wendover. Then, the first 200 people that go to that link will also get 20% off their annual premium subscription. 